You're listening to episode number 33 of the Animals at Home podcast. If this is your first time listening to the show, then welcome. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Dylan. And if you're a regular listener, then of course, thank you so much for joining me every two weeks. I appreciate your support very, very much. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to thank our sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. Go check out their website. You'll always find links in the YouTube description as well as on the show notes. They have a ton of different products from BioDude, Universal Rocks, Arcadia. The list continues to go on. Even if you're not in the market for something, I highly recommend going to check them out. And if you do happen to purchase something through one of the links that I provide you, I do get a commission, which means you're going to be supporting the show as well as supporting your animal with the gold standard equipment. You can also find them on Instagram at Custom Reptile Habitats. There's a bunch of different pictures of the different setups they've built. It's uh, it's really awesome. So I highly recommend at least going to check them out and following them on Instagram so you can keep track of what they're up to. Joining me on today's episode is Roy Arthur Blodgett. Roy is actually one of the listeners to the podcast and a few months ago he reached out to me and we ended up emailing back and forth and I quickly realized we could have a pretty engaging conversation on the podcast. So I invited him on the show, he was gracious enough to accept the invitation and we had a really great chat here. As you can see we went over the usual 60 minutes because we were engaged in a pretty good conversation. Roy is one of the first individuals in the U.S. to actually hatch a clutch of Amazon puffing snakes. So we discussed that story, how he acquired his first pair, the care of these animals. We also discussed how he took a 10-year break from the hobby and how he's now come back into the hobby with a new fresh mindset. And he is back working with the Amazon puffing snake with a goal of producing a captive-bred, captive-born clutch of snakes. These are a neotropical arboreal colubrid, they're really, really incredible species, very diverse in their sort of phenotype as well as their behavior is just fascinating to watch. And there's really not a lot of these in captivity in the United States, so it was fascinating listening to him talk about them and the way he has them set up with these bioactive enclosures and whatnot. And near the back end of this episode, we discuss a, a topic that I really try to hit on on almost every episode, but we got to it into a little bit more depth in this episode, and that is the responsibility and purpose that people derive from caring for their animals. And, you know, there's a lot of people in the hobby that use their animals to get through a hard time, and we kind of break that down a little bit. And it was really, really interesting. So I hope you enjoy the conversation, and I will talk to you at the end of the episode. All right. Well, Roy, thank you very much for joining me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, as we were saying before we officially started recording, you're, I think, the first just listener to be uh, invited onto the show to chat. And I, I think you reached out to me a few weeks ago. We seemingly are contending with a few of the same sort of ethical questions and issues when it comes to keeping exotic animals. And and honestly, I do hear from people quite often that just reach out just to say thanks for talking about some of these issues because it's not something that gets you know, talked about a lot. And, and, but in your case, you had sent me this very thorough, well-written email and we kind of started going back and forth. And I thought instead of just typing back and forth, we should have a conversation and, and we can kind of you know, be a little, getting some more depth in that case. So, so thank you very much for joining me. Um, has keeping exotic animals been something that has been with you from day one or, or how did this evolve into your life? Um, yeah, definitely since day one, I, um, as a child, um, I was born into a house with a lot of animals and my dad in particular kept, um, kept reptiles and, um, and also tarantulas and some invertebrates and stuff like that. And, um, and actually one of my earliest memories, um, comes from around the time I was, I think it was around three, maybe four years old, um, of going to a reptile show with my dad and he, um, he bought me a, a king snake, a California king snake. Um, and I remember distinctly like coming home with this little baby king snake in a deli cup. And, <laughs> and, um, I, and when I think back now, I'm like that really, that's must be one of my earliest memories. Cause I was very little at that time. And, you know, it's like very vague kind of amorphous memory that I have, but, um, I ended up having that snake until I was 18. That's um, awesome. Yeah. What, what sort yeah. of uh, snakes and reptiles did your dad keep? You know, he was kind of all over the place. We had, um, I think his kind of his prize um, specimen was a, he had an Eastern indigo snake that I remember pretty distinctly. Oh, that cool. was really, really beautiful. Um, he had yellow anaconda and Savannah monitor and, um, it was a broad array of, of lizards and snakes and a few frogs. Um, 
but I think his, his main thing was snakes. He, he seemed to be mostly drawn to them. And that that's also true for me. That's pretty cool. I mean, obviously that was several years ago and that's like early days <laughs> reptile hobby. Like that's when people were still, yeah. you tried to do like everything on your own in terms of equipment and everything. Did, were you able totally. to be involved in the uh, care at all? Um, you know, in the early, early days, I, I wasn't very much. Um, although from the time I was about eight or nine years old on, I was, I was taking care of that king snake on my own. Um, and it was kind of an early um, piece of responsibility that I had, you know, that, um, that I remember. And, um, you know, fortunately, that, that was a really durable, hardy snake, you know, yeah, they yeah. went through a lot with me, um, um, went through a couple of cross country moves with me. Um, and and really fared really well, but definitely, you know, I learned some things from my father, but I think that most of what I learned, um, was just through my own tinkering and trial and error and, and reading, you know, magazines and books, but. So, so that's kind of what I wanted to jump into because you do keep a very unique species, the puffing snake, and it's not something that you see all the time. So I, I want to know, I guess this is a two part question and depending on how you answer it, maybe it's one or two questions. You, somehow you got into these snakes. So I'd love to hear uh, what, what your first interaction with these puffing snakes was. And then I know you took a break from the hobby and then came back in. So I'd love to know why you took the break and, and, and what drew you back in. Is that a giant question to ask? It is kind of a giant <laughs> question, but I think it's a story worth telling. Yeah. So I can kind of go into it. Um, I guess in, I can approach what kind of drew me to puffing snakes first. And, um, and yeah, so into my... Um, teenage in particularly in my kind of like my teenage years and um as you know approaching young adulthood i um i lived with my mom and um we lived in pretty modest like poverty line conditions together in a in a trailer park in santa rosa and um had a pretty challenging you know, there were challenging circumstances for us at that time. And, um, and yet I was very immersed in this world of working with snakes. And I was really particularly drawn to um, snakes at that time, which were just really obscure and particularly um, neotropical colubrid species like um, dry marcon, like yellow tailed kribos and um, tiger rat snakes, which is the other species in the Spilodes genus alongside the puffing snakes. And, um, and at that time, the puffing snakes, there were only like a few people in the country that, that were working with that species and everything, um, in the reptile hobby at that moment seemed to be gravitating around kingsnake.com and the kind of forums that existed there and the classified ads that were there. And, and, um, I remember some folks posting in the, in the forum for, I think it was the Indigo forum, which was the one when I would hang out in a lot um, and posting these pictures of these puffing snakes. And at that time they were classified in their own genus of Sustis um, alongside um, what's now Phrynonax postalinatus. Um, they were both classified under Sustis and, um, and I remember back then also, you know, kind of talking to friends and being like, you know, I think these, these, these big puffing snakes, they're kind of more like Spilodes than, than, than these other ones. And what, um, what made so you think, kind of, what made you think that was it just morphologically just looking at them or yeah, morphologically and also the behavior of the kind of, they, they inflate their throats. Right. Um, and they just have some unique characteristics, um, heavily keeled scales and also the size, but, um, it was definitely a gratifying thing when, you know, when I did come return to the hobby, you know, almost over a decade later, um, that, that all the reclassification had happened and I was like, Oh, they're, they're spilities after all. But in any case, um, I started to see these puffing snakes on the, on that forum. And not long after that, um, an opportunity came up on the classifieds of a pair of puffing snakes that had come in and they were, freshly imported snakes um a dealer in florida had them and i was able to kind of scrape together the money from um basically my only source of income was was keeping and breeding snakes and lizards at that point and um or primarily lizards at that point and um 
And so I was able to get these snakes. The person gave me a little bit of time to scrape together the money, which was really um, fortunate. And at this time I was, I was 16 years old. Um, and I remember staying home from school to receive these snakes and, um, and unboxing this box and out comes this like eight to nine foot long solid yellow snake oh my god immediately inflates its throat and is like so they were full adults when (laughs) yeah they were full full grown adults wow and and the female was a little bit smaller but still you know seven feet long and they're quite slender built so she wasn't as big as the male but the male was just a really impressive snake and i was like i have never seen anything like this before um, and they were, and they didn't look anything alike. They're, but they're an incredibly variable species. So this, at this time, the male that I had was almost solid yellow, had no pattern. And the female was kind of a beautiful olive green, but she had a golden head and a black tail and some kind of gold banding. Um, and, um, I started working with these snakes for a little while and was just like totally captivated by them. They're just, their behavior um were you afraid of them at first like when you pulled this giant snake out of like that's probably much bigger than anything you've worked with in the past i'm sure if you're working with king snakes and whatnot yeah he was definitely that male that first male was the biggest snake i ever worked and i wasn't afraid but i was definitely like this is a formidable snake and that snake was not it did not like me (laughs) you know you he would totally bite if he had the chance um but i um, and he would inflate and, you know, it was a very impressive display, you know, of like, wow, this is a formidable snake. And, um, and he would, you know, he was really tuned into my movement. I remember if I would move, he was like with me, you know, it was almost like a Cobra kind of, um, and soon after receiving these snakes, I, um, realized that the female was gravid and I was kind of like, Oh my goodness. You know, what is, what is this? What is going to happen? <laughs> and, and at that point I had never hatched snake eggs. I'd hatched hundreds of lizard eggs, but, um, what lizards were you working with at the time? Um, mostly bearded dragons, um, were kind of like, you know, just like a bread and butter, like, you know, species that I had been keeping for years at that point, but also some of the stuff. I had some helmeted iguanas, the Cory Tofanis Christatus, um, those were really cool lizards that I worked with. Um, I had some Aki monitors, Richdale monitors. Um, loved working with those. But but I was suddenly like, wow, I, I'm about to receive a clutch of eggs that at this point only one other person I knew of had ever hatched these snakes. Um, and um, And so... I was, I was just amazed. And, and I, I went and bought, um, another little hovabator incubator <laughs> from the feed store and tinkered with it meticulously until I could get it to about 78 to 80 degrees and, um, receive this clutch of eggs. And, um, I checked that incubator three times a day for 97 days, <laughs> <laughs> just anxiously, like, awaiting these eggs and um did you have any idea of the incubation incubation period or was it just sort of just we'll see when these guys come out i had no idea wow. i really had no idea i figured it would be around 100 days 90 to 100 but i but there i didn't have um a clear knowing of that it was just like that was kind of what um folks that were ta- was talking to online expected from them and um I'll never forget like the day, you know, when that, when I, um, you know, I had, I was getting ready for school and I went to go check the incubator before I went out the door and the eggs had deflated. And one of them had this slit, you know, one, one hatchling had pipped. And I remember, I just like, it's like, all right, I'm staying home. Yeah. Another day <laughs> and, missed. <laughs> yeah. Another day missed. Unfortunately I was a really good student, so I could, I could get away with that. But, yeah. Um, but I, I mean, it was just a magical, it was like the first like experience that I had, it was just like with, with something so, um, it was just profound. It was a profound experience, like seeing these snakes emerge from the eggs. And, you know, when they, when they first hatched, there's just these like velvety, smooth, like immaculate little snakes. And, um, 
And another really interesting thing about this species is that they go through an ontogenetic color shift. And so when they're born, they all look pretty much the same. And they're just these black and gray snakes with these kind of black chevrons on their backs. And, um, and each time they shed, they start to get a little bit more colorful. And, and, you know, in a single clutch, you could have snakes that are solid yellow or that are like yellow and black banding or green and yellow or solid green or red and yellow. It's like all over the place. And so there was so much excitement about like, wow, this is something that like very few people have ever had the privilege of witnessing and I'm witnessing it right now. And, um, that, that was just like, at that point in my life, it was probably the proudest achievement of my life hatching those snakes. <laughs> that is amazing. So was the, yeah. was the male snake you had, was it the father or, or, or cause I assume these were wild caught, right? So they, you probably had they no, were. yeah. 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 And I, I don't think it was the father. I think it was probably a wild snake that, um, that was the sire of that clutch. Um, so she was because, captured already gravid. Yeah. Already gravid. Yeah. I think that must've been the case. Um, seems pretty unlikely that they would have locked up in, you know, in a bag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but, um, and do you mind yeah. saying how much you paid for them, the pair when you originally got it? I think it was six hundred dollars. Oh, okay. Um, as a, so, pair. as a teenager, that's the, you got to start scraping some stuff. But that's not too bad, actually. Yeah, that's not too bad, you know. And now, now, like it's pretty, it's pretty rare to find to find them in that kind of price. But at the time, that was like, wow, I, I can barely make this happen. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Like I won't um, be eating but, for a while. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like you know I was really scraping it together, but um, but I had the, I had an enclosure ready for them and everything and um. And those snakes did really well while I had them. Um, eventually, the female ended up going off on breeding loan to someone else, and um, and the male the male ended up dying after a couple of years from something that it was like a an injury that he just sustained, sustained while in his enclosure. It was kind of like a freak thing that happened where he got kind of pinned somehow and and hurt himself and. That was really strange. I've still to this day never seen anything else quite like that. But um, hatching those snakes was just such a such a gift, and and then also figuring out like how do you how to get them started, you know? And was that um, difficult? It actually, you know, it was surprisingly not that difficult. I expected it to be a lot harder, um, but I I learned that um, that if you, if you would kind of grasp the snakes in one hand, you know, with, with part of their body extended and kind of wiggle a pinky in front of them and then, until they struck. And it was kind of, you had to kind of irritate them a little bit to do that. But once they grabbed onto the pinky, they would just immediately swallow it. Um, and they would do that. It, it took a few times of doing that and then they would just start taking pinkies on their own. But so did you end up raising these guys up to sell them or what was your plan at this point? I guess you probably, I mean, you weren't planning on having a clutch of puffing totally. snake eggs. <laughs> yeah, totally. It wasn't my plan. And, um, um, yeah, originally I, my plan was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to keep a pair, um, to raise up, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to experience that the whole like experience of the color shift and everything. And, um, and then the others I ended up sending out, um, to be with other people that were working with the species. I had a friend, um, um, Nate up in Oregon who I sent a trio to. Um, and then I think another, I think one of the hatchlings didn't survive. Um, and then the others, like, I think there's another, um, two specimens that went, went with someone else. And I don't remember at this point. Um, and then those soon after this, all of this happened, um, is kind of leading to, you know, getting out of the hobby and taking this break for a while. Um, I just got into some like really dire straits, um, really living, kind of reaching adulthood, graduation from high school. It was like time for me to be out on my own. Um, and I realized that the environment that I was in was really just not healthy and it was pretty, it was pretty toxic. And so, um, it, but it, but it, that happened pretty quickly. And ultimately I had to very quickly kind of, um, dismantle this, this modest, um, grouping of snakes that I had at that time that I was working with. And, um, you know, many of them went to people I knew or friends, but a lot of them, um, 
I ended up having to just take to the nearest like big reptile shop and essentially like wholesaling out. There's a big place in, um, in Berkeley, California called the East Bay Vivarium. It's kind of a legendary, like big, you know, reptile breeder distributor. And they ended up taking a lot of what I had. Um, cause I just had to get out of there. And, um, it was just, it was one of the hardest decisions I had ever had to make at that point. Um, and yeah. And so I was, pretty heartbroken by that pretty devastated by the by the need to do that and also it was like as soon as i was out on my own it was like a profound a profoundly opening experience for me of like wow i'm my life feels completely different now i'm like um and and i kind of reveled in that for (laughs) for quite a while of just like what it was to be able to take care of myself um well and and um be in sa- a safe environment and um a, i kind of shifted my focus in terms of keeping reptiles because i did because i didn't have any money i was working minimum wage and i i um i'm blessed to live in one of the most beautiful and correspondingly most expensive places in the country <laughs> um up in northern california in sonoma county and um and so I was just scraping by, you know, minimum wage, you know, renting a room somewhere, but I was so happy with that. And I shifted my focus in terms of my relationships to animals and reptiles to just, um, being in nature, being outside. And, um, and that actually really, um, was a profound gift because I suddenly had this, this deeper awareness of the interrelationships that they had and like their, their ecological roles. And, um, had a, like a lot of um, amazing experiences, like which at the time I kind of took for granted. And one, like one that comes to mind is um, was I had the opportunity to witness a rattlesnake giving birth. Wow! Um, and because there were there are several rattlesnake dens that I had kind of found, and I would go visit periodically and just kind of check out the snakes and hang out with the snakes. And one time I went, and this female snake was giving birth there. And at the time I was like, wow, this is a profound you know experience and i was just like and you know people probably see this you know yeah yeah <laughs> and now i've like uh, now that i'm older and i've kind of spoken to a lot of like people who like spend like decades in the fields <laughs> watching rattlesnakes have never witnessed that you know and so i had a lot of really blessed experiences with um the snakes outside and um and that had been kind of my focus for about a decade. It was really just kind of becoming um, um, a skilled naturalist, you know, and I, I did a lot of wildlife tracking and um, learned a lot about bird language and, um, and all of that. And um, but got to a point in last year where I realized that um, I missed tending to snakes in my daily life at home and like having that kind of relationship with them. Um, and, um, I started to have a kind of a, being so far removed from, you know, that, that time of my life when, when I had to dismantle the, the collection and everything, um, I suddenly had this awareness of like, wow, that it was actually the opportunity to work with snakes and keep snakes that like kept me well during that whole period of my life. Um, and just like being in that relationship of, of tending to something, having a responsibility, having a role, um, day in and day out. And also just being in, in proximity to these really sensitive creatures that require a lot of, um, presence and awareness. Um, and so, I started looking around a little bit to see, I kind of Googled like Susti sulfurious, you know, yeah, and starting from scratch. Anyone, yeah. Is anyone working with this species right now? And wow, it'd be so cool if someone was doing it and producing captive born specimens now. And, um, and ultimately that led me to, um, Jason hood, who is, um, he's an awesome, um, breeder in, he's based out of Florida right now. Um, he was actually like achieving consistent success breeding that species. And I reached out to him and, um, kind of introduced myself and, and, um, 
and offhandedly kind of mentioned like, also, if you happen to know this person, John, um, can you forward him my email? Cause I'd love to get back in touch with him. And he writes back like a few hours later and he's like, I know exactly who you are. Like I tried to find you a few years ago when I started working with these species and everyone would kind of wondered if you were dead. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize you were like a young guy. I thought you, maybe you were an old guy. <laughs> You're like and, the um, myth of behind these snakes. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I had no idea, you know, and, and then he, um, <laughs> he's like, and, and he's like, yeah, and I know John and he, um, he, cc john on that email and, and kind of added a little thing of like look roy's back from the dead and <laughs> and john wrote and as it had turned out john who was you know one of the other people that was really interested in these snakes at that time had ended up with one of the snakes that i had hatched and now it was like a 10 foot long behemoth <laughs> um but was also just like this puppy dog tame beautiful black and gold black and yellow snake and um and he's like roy it's so cool to hear that you're interested in working with these snakes now um and we kind of exchanged some email he's like he's like it's actually really interesting timing because i just i just kind of made up my mind that um that i wanted to kind of let that project move on to someone else because john is really focused on working with um the other species of Spilotes and he's, um, he's working with, um, Mexicanus, which are this really amazing Northern locality of that species. And, um, so ultimately I, 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 after a almost, um, 11 year period of no contact whatsoever, I just happened to email John like the exact moment when he had decided that he was ready to part with these snakes. That's amazing. And, and so a couple months later, um, he sent me this snake that I had hatched. So did he ship, he shipped it to you? <laughs> yeah, he shipped it to me. And, um, alongside, um, a female that had been, um, captive bred by Tom Davis, who was that other person who had hatched them, but actually before I had, um, the only other person who had done it at that point. And, um, that snake ended up turning out to be a male. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that so doesn't I, work <laughs> you know, and um and i you know i realized like when i kind of paired them up i was like that kind of that kind of looks like ritual combat that doesn't really look like courtship behavior and I kind of emailed john and kind of and then eventually i did i did determine that that thing was a male and um um have since actually acquired um uh, two adult um one sub adult and one adult female both of whom are wild caught because i couldn't find any captive born adult females and uh, so i'm currently working on establishing them getting them acclimated um and hoping to hoping to pair them up with this male next year because i really want i'd love to be able to pass on his his genetics because totally. he's unrelated to any other snakes in the in in the united states right now and he's also um currently the largest known specimen in captivity at, at he's almost 11 feet now and weighs about nine pounds wow that's <laughs> so amazing a really impressive snake and um and would really love to give him the opportunity to pass his genes on as he's as he's starting to get older now he's almost 12 right and going, going strong but who knows how long the you know he has the chance to do that right so it's it is so interesting and it must have been like almost refreshing to start the hobby from scratch in a way like so many of us get into the hobby sort of fumble our way into it and do everything wrong to begin with and and you have setups that you can't really change because they're already going it would be so interesting to just delete your whole setup and then start again where you have way more knowledge was it kind of like rejuvenating when you did that Oh, it was totally rejuvenating. Also, you know, also just being that I'm an adult. So you have, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so you have some money you could spend. I have, yeah, I have a little bit more, you know, in terms of resources. I, I, I live really modestly. I don't have much of, of, a, uh, of an income, but at the same time, it's like I have more resources than I had then. Um, and also the just what's available in terms of like um, lighting and heating and all of that is, is a lot better now. And um and it's, it's also been awesome to see kind of the um, growing trend of keeping um, snakes in bioactive setups, which is something that I was kind of trying to do back then. Like I was making my own substrate blends, you know, and, um, and using leaf litter and, um, and uh, not, not intentionally 
um, bringing in springtails and, and microfauna and stuff like that, but they were there, you know, right. just because they're in the leaf litter and all that. And, um, and so it was really cool to see like, wow, this is okay. So people are doing this now and there's a little bit more of understanding how to do it. And so, um, yeah, it was amazing. It's been amazing to set the, um, set these snakes up in fully bioactive, big enclosures with, um, all live plants and full spectrum lighting and heat. And, um, you know, that, that was just like not possible essentially at that time. Right. So, so can you tell, tell us what, what you have them set up in like the big male, that's a very, very large snake. What sort of setup is he in? Yeah. So right now I have them set up in, um, a six foot tall by four foot wide by a two foot deep enclosure. And that's going to be currently, um, very excitingly, um, in talks about designing a custom upgrade enclosure in this coming year, that's going to be an eight foot long, three foot deep by seven foot tall enclosure. Wow. Um, it's just going to be fully bioactive live plants. Um, and I'm really excited for that because, because even now it's like by, by most standards, that's a huge enclosure, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's like, for me, I'm, I'm like, got to get you into something bigger. You know, I see him in there and, he, and he's, he's doing great. You know, it's, he's not suffering or anything like that, but I definitely want to give him a lot more space to explore yeah. and roam around. And, yeah. Um, it's like whenever you see your snake, uh, like so much of the time they spend <laughs> hiding. So you're like, Oh, the, the enclosure is yeah, fine. Totally. But then as soon as you see them cruising around, you're like, Oh my God, I need to give you like 10 times totally. as much space. Exactly. You know, and like, I'd, I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to build like a big outdoor enclosure, like a walk-in kind of thing, you know, and, um, and then that's in the, that's, that's going to happen down the line at some point. But, um, yeah, you know, I think that these snakes, they definitely fare, fare better with a lot more space than, um, than a lot of snakes. They're, they're very active. Um, they're arboreal, um, but are also observed on the forest floor a lot. Um, and part of what also I think is so captivating about them is that there's just very little actually available in terms of um, studies on their natural history. Um, and so I'm kind of like really trying to learn from these snakes and really observe them as well as I can and let them inform how to, how to take the best care of them and, um, give them the, the best possible environment. Um, but they, um, they're native to the Amazon basin. So, um, you know, that's a 12 hour light cycle pretty much year round, um, and I also um, emulate the wet and dry seasons essentially in their enclosures through daily misting. Um, just by hand? By hand. Yeah. Um, I re- and that's, that's a choice. I like to do it by hand. Right. Um, I think when I set them up in the bigger enclosure, I'll probably have a misting system in addition to that just to, um, just cause that's going to be quite a, quite a thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to get a sore arm misting like an eight foot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, um, yeah. And, and, you know, like that's a, that's, a, that's the major, um, seasonal cyclical thing that's occurring down there is, um, is the wet and dry season, you know, and of course, even the dry season there is still wet in comparison to like a temperate environment. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, that's a major, major thing that I'm working with in terms of cycling them. Um, and, and do you dip temperatures as well in when you're going to the rainy season or a little bit not not a great deal but um but i do a little bit and i do a little bit of a night drop as well right um not not a great deal but um they actually don't really like it too hot um seems like mid 80s yeah. i'm on the warm the warm end of the enclosure it seems like um, a lot of amazonian species actually seem to like it cooler and yeah. I think that's one of the things that in the hobby, we may be keeping some of them too warm because the forest yeah. floor is pretty cold. Like you said, it's wet. There's totally. lots of shade. And exactly. my boas hang out on their cold side all the time. Like sometimes after a meal and whatnot, they're they're on the warm side, but so often they're in like the 70, like 75, 78 yeah. degrees. It's interesting. That's where they like it. Yeah. So that's where I try to keep the, the kind of ambient is like right around um, mid 70s. Um, and then, um, I focus on creating basking areas that get up into around, you know, the mid nineties, maybe, um, peaking. And, um, so they can get under that and kind of, but I very rarely see them basking underneath the heat unless it's like they, yeah, again, they've just eaten and, um, they're pretty, pretty much comfortable in like the the high seventies. 
how are you accomplishing the bioactive? Do you have a drainage layer and a bunch of soil or, or what do you? I don't actually have a drainage layer right now. Um, I think I will incorporate one in this next enclosure just cause I'll have more, um, I'll have a deeper substrate layer, right? But I currently, um, the enclosures that I have them in right now don't allow for a deep enough substrate layer to have a good drainage layer. Um, and so actually all of the plants that I have are planted into cork rounds that oh, cool. basically get into planters. Um, and then there is like, um, there is, you know, substrate in addition to that. And actually the roots spill out beneath the cork rounds right. and go out into that and spread out. Um, but I just, I'm just really, um, um, on it in terms of like anytime they defecate, like I'm removing solid waste and kind of turning the soil over any, any residual stuff. And it's actually functioned really well. Like it's not smelly. Um, I haven't had, I've had them in pretty much the same substrate now for almost a year cycling and the microfauna is booming in there. That's um, awesome. I feel like we, we perceive well. bioactive in snakes to be harder than it actually is like it just yeah. because they do produce a lot of waste. And, and like you said, as long as you're removing it, you can actually manage the system quite well. Yeah. It's I honestly, like I, I'm never going back, Yeah, <laughs> you know, to the alternative at this point, I'm pretty sold and it does take a bit, you know, to get things established, you know, it took probably a month um, to two months to, for everything to get kind of established and for the microfauna to, to spread out, you know, and, and occupy the whole substrate layer and all that. But at this point, it's like, it's really working well and all the plants are established. And what are you using for plants? Um, I've got a whole variety of, I've, I've, I've um, focused on entirely plants from Central and South America, just because cool. I'd like to keep it as close as I can. Um, but there's a, there's a pretty broad variety. I kind of focused on creating a few kind of larger species um, as like the showcase species. And then um, I've got bromeliads up in the top and then vines and um, to kind of even things out. And um, the, the major um, kind of central species that I'm using right now is um, Monstera deliciosa, which is a kind of, um, sometimes they're called split-leaved philodendrons. Okay, yeah. Um, and um, those are doing great in there. And then I have a few other philodendron species um, that are more vining plants that um, I actually mounted in cork tubes up in the up in the upper branches and so the vines kind of trailed down and then um, I've mounted a whole bunch of neoregilia um, and etchmia bromeliads throughout the enclosure and um, it looks great I mean it's 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 a beautiful do you have pictures stuff. somewhere of, of the enclosure yeah I do I, I've posted a few little short um, videos actually on the everything Spilodes page on on facebook which is kind of the, the main group i hang out in but i'm going to be making a post pretty soon on um puffing snakes.com the okay. website I, I manage about these snakes that's going to be all about like getting the bioactive setup going okay but cool yeah because i was looking to the website and i there's awesome pictures of the snakes but nothing of like the, yeah. the setup so that sounds amazing are the snakes yeah. uh are they rough on the plants because they're such a big animal and they move so quickly yeah, they can be, they can be a little bit rough. You know, it's, it's actually the way that I've kind of, um, set everything up. I tried to keep that in mind. And so I kind of positioned the plants in areas where there's like branches around them that, that, that the snakes are using as their primary support. So they're not like just putting all their weight on the plants and crushing them. And that's actually worked really well. I was kind of, I was kind of expecting that they were just going to demolish the plant. Yeah. Just bulldoze <laughs> everything. I, yeah. When I put them in there and, and I, I, like now it's, it's been, um, next month it'll be a year since I've had them and, um, and the plants are still intact, you know, and they do, they do over time, um, sometimes get a little tattered. Um, and, but that's actually fine. Cause I, you know, I, I need to occasionally prune them anyway. Right. And so when they start to get really tired, I'll just prune them back and then, you know, add that, in, cut them up and add that into the substrate for the microfauna. That works really well. Well, um, it's, it sounds like you're doing everything possible to do it right. Like it sounds amazing. Like even to the keeping the plants that are native to where they're from, it sounds, I mean, they're, they're such a cool and like I said, unique species. Not a lot of people see puffing snakes around and even yeah. watching them move is like so mesmerizing almost. Yeah. Yeah. It's really amazing. They're watching them and, 
um, particularly the male, you know, he's the most confident of the, of the three that I have right now. Cause you know, he's, he was born in captive conditions and, um, you know, and I'm really aiming to build trust with the females so that they're more comfortable, um, coming out and basking more regularly and stuff like that. But watching his, just his daily routines, you know, like I know him well at this point <laughs> and you know, he has his morning basking and his evening basking. And, um, and I really enjoy like all, if I'm home, you know, I'll just, I'll just open up the door of his, of his enclosure, you know? And, and so he has the opportunity to just come out if he wants to. And it's pretty funny because he'll come out and he'll kind of like do a, he does like kind of a loop of the living room and then just goes right back into his enclosure and goes and coils up in his cork and goes to sleep. And that's awesome. <laughs> it's like, that's all I need. Just check. Yeah, everything's like little, good. <laughs> everything's good. Yeah. He's doing his little rounds. <laughs> oh, that's very cool. So what, what has been, what has it been like having the wild caught animals? Obviously this is something that we kind of discussed through emails yeah. and, and the, even discussing the ethical implications of wild caught. Um, in this case, it's very different because it's not like you're poaching a ball python that there's millions of them. This is a, a species that we don't have established in the hobby. Totally. And uh, so, so in terms of working with those animals, have they been, is it been stressful to work with? Are they difficult to, to feed? Definitely. <laughs> um, <laughs> all of the above. All of the above. It's definitely a whole other game, you know, and, and like for really for anyone who, you know, occasionally folks ask me like, you know, where do you, where do you find them? Or like, where, what, how do you get these snakes, you know? And so like that. And I'm always like, talk to Jason Hood, like, because he's producing, he's the only one really producing captive bred ones um, consistently right now. And, and, um, and it is such a different experience working with captive bred. Um, and captive bred and porn snakes and and also you know like part of that also is the ethics behind it is that like i feel like um you know as someone who's who's really dedicated to the species and really wants to work on helping to establish them and create more um genetic diversity within the hobby um and all of that right now it's like that i'm really focused on getting them well established and like doing the work but but that's a challenging thing you know and um and I think that the vast majority of puffing snakes that probably come in, you know, end up in the hands of people that don't actually know how to, how to get them established. And, and, um, and even saying that I don't necessarily consider myself someone who knows exactly how to do it either. You know, I'm, I'm learning as I go and I've definitely got more experience than the average. But you know, at least the that's the plan, right? You have the plan that's the to plan. do that. Yeah. I have the plan and like, and I'm also allocating the resources to do that, you know, and, um, but essentially, yeah, it's like, I feel like, you know, with a species like this, it's, it's, it's important to get them established in captivity, especially because of what's happening in their native range right now. Um, and I'm honestly like, one of the things that I'm most excited about um, now that I'm, you know, approaching the hobby again from a kind of a fresh start and kind of reestablishing myself in the community and everything is, is just advocating for like, what can we do as um, as keepers of snakes in captivity to leverage the potential resources created by that, particularly by breeding them, to support them in their native range? Um, and that is like really where it's at for me in, in terms of working with these snakes. And I'm really hoping that um, I can get these two females um, really well established and um, ultimately breed them and and um, utilize the potential revenue from that to like go straight to conservation efforts. Um, but anyway, as, as for like getting them established, um, um, I found that, um, they really fare best when, when you, when they've just come in, you know, it's such a stressful experience for them. And I kind of focus on like hydration, um, security and nutrition. Um, as like the first three things that I'm focused on. Um, so the first thing I do when I, when, when they arrive is I, is I take them out and I put them in a, in a container and mist them. And um, pretty much invariably they just sit there and drink for 10 minutes, you right. know, yeah, yeah. and um, getting really well hydrated. And then um, I set them up in, in these, these quarantine enclosures that I, that I make by modifying big, big plastic, um, storage totes, like, um, those rubber made and sterilite kind of, um, things that you can get at the, at the hardware store. And, um, so I modify those, I add in ventilation grommets with a, with a differential to get some ventilation through them. 
um, install heat panels and UV lights to the, to the, um, lids of those and in branches and, um, and some, um, faux plants and, and a couple hides and, um, and I keep them in there to start because I, I found that the actual, the, um, being in a, a completely op opaque tub like that for that initial period is really helpful because it's almost like being in like a really big hide. Um, if there's just a little bit less sensory, um, stimuli, um, and it helps them just kind of settle down and, um, and get established. And I found that when I've done that, they, they start eating right away. Um, um, which is great because that's something that a lot of people can struggle with. Um, and then after a few weeks of, of them eating regularly, I start assessing for, um, for parasites. And um, that means collecting a fecal sample, taking it to a veterinarian for analysis, and then having them prescribe the appropriate um, medications and dosages. Um, is it pretty much always, is there something in there almost all the time? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, while, you know, wild snakes, you know, especially in a region like the Amazon where they're eating a, I think that they have a pretty varied diet, you know, right. in their native range. Um, they're going to be getting all kinds of stuff. And that, that becomes, you know, and, and in the wild, that is fully manageable for a lot of different reasons. Um, right. But, but when you have them in a captive, in captive conditions, um, you have elevated stress levels, especially when they're, when they're in quarantine and, and when they're first acclimating. Um, and you have the, a greater potential for re-exposure to parasites because if you're not right on it when they defecate, getting that waste out of there, um, they, they, the re-exposure to the parasites is, is highly um, increased, the likelihood of that. And so um, keeping them really clean is really important through the, the quarantine and acclimation process. Um, and also, you know, actually being sure that what you're treating, <laughs> that you're treating the right parasites. Cause there's also, you know, it's pretty common practice with, um, wild caught snakes to just kind of, um, do shotgun treatments of a few pretty like common, um, medications and, um, and then call it good. <laughs> it's like that can actually do a lot to harm the snake because you're also taking out beneficial gut flora and fauna. And, um, and so being on top of that with actually the advice of a veterinarian is something that I strongly advocate. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And so uh, in terms of, so once they are healthy and does it take a while to get rid of the parasites or because I, like you said, they, they're kind of coming in like fully loaded in terms of like right. a lot of different <laughs> things. Is it just a few weeks or do you find that it takes like several months to get them established? I would say um, a couple months is a good is a good idea. Um, I think that a quarantine period of of three to six months with a species like this is a good idea. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, a lot of people, a lot of people take them out of quarantine um, too quickly. I think um, like they'll they'll do the shotgun treatments and call it good, and then move them right in with the rest of their their snakes. You know, and and. Um, and so I've got the the two females um, in quarantine in a separate room right now. Um, and at one point, I actually had I had gotten a clean bill of health from the vet with um, the large the adult female, and um, had actually had her in. Um, there's a way I can separate the the big enclosure that the male is in into two smaller enclosures, um, and because um, there's a pass through that I can close. And had her in one of one side of the pasture, and um, and she didn't do as well in there. I think it was just it was stressful to transition her like that. So I ended up taking her and moving her back into quarantine, and that's where she she is now. Um, but but since then she's been doing really well, and she actually just um, she just cycled eggs and laid <laughs> laid an infertile clutch of eggs, and um, which was not something I, I really wanted her to do. I was like kind of hoping that it, she would get a gain a bit more size and everything before cycling. And, um, um, but she's, she's done well since then. She actually, um, struggled to pass one of the eggs, but has since passed that egg, thankfully. Oh, so, good, good. And yeah. what about behavior wise? Are they, are they aggressive? Are they very afraid of you or can you somewhat interact with them? Yeah. I, you know, I think that they're, it definitely varies from snake to snake. One of the females is pretty aggressive. 
Um, or, I, you know, I wouldn't even necessarily say aggressive so much as just defensive. I think that one, when they're in the, the um, enclosures, I, I always use a hook to, to take them out. Um, and then once they're out, I usually set down the hook and I'm able to just handle them and just be very gentle. You know, it's like with any snake, you know, if, if you're, if you grasp them and start to restrain their movement they're it's going to stress them out. And so I just try to let them move, um, and move with them. And, um, and they're usually fine. Um, if they do start to get stressed, they they can be a handful because <laughs> they'll definitely particularly one of females turns and she goes right for my face and um and so i'm dodging you know strikes to my face while i'm trying to like move her to you know the to the tub to weigh her or whatever well <laughs> whatever. there's this that there's a video that you posted from youtube <laughs> on your website and from a wild someone's yeah. filming and it's amazing the strike range on this animal. It looks like <laughs> yeah. it's like a six foot strike range. Like this guy's like yeah. way far back and it's lunging. And the other thing that people may not realize is and I, I don't, it's not serious, but they actually are rear fang venomous. They are. Yeah, they are. Yeah. And that was actually, that a was surprise. a new development. <laughs> that was another thing that occurred in the, um, the time while I was away. It's like snakes that were classified everywhere at that time as harmless, non-venomous snakes. Um, oh, they're actually rear fanged and they have, um, a, a three finger toxin, you know, like a lot of the lapids do. And, um, and you know, that still it's like the actual venom delivery system is, is, is unsophisticated. They're, you know, they're an epistoglyphus, um, rear fang snake. Um, and, um, unfortunately when they do bite it, they don't tend to like grab on and chew. It's like they, they strike and, and then they turn and run <laughs> is my experience. It's pretty much, they just want to get away. Um, but I do, you know, I do handle them mindfully with that just cause, cause, um, based on all of the, the studies that have been done so far, um, on that venom, there's no real like cause for alarm. It's not like, you know, you know, Thraceops or like, um, um, Thelotornis or Dysphilitis, you know, all these genus, you know, that, that are like, or even, you know, Boiga and, you know, in Southeast Asia, um, it's, it's considered a, definitely an order below those in terms of venom toxicity. Um, but I, just because it's like the way that, you know, LD50 and on all these, all these definitely, things are they're measured it's like it's pretty um ambiguous uh, you know sure. and and so i i hand, handle them mindfully and i have taken a few bites um but never like a significant one and and um have pretty much noticed no real effects apart from one bite where i did notice an itchiness um, right around the bite site that was kind of like, all right, I got to keep an eye on this. Yeah. Cause I guess that's the other thing is there could be allergic reaction to the venom. That's not necessarily with the venom mode of action, but absolutely. you could react to it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, and I, and I definitely advocate too for people, you know, working with them that like, you know, be mindful with them, you know, and, and, um, I, d I personally don't treat them like, you know, they're a front fanged, you know, snake, I work a lot with rattlesnakes. That's something I do here is, is, um, help people with, um, rattlesnake consultations around their properties and stuff like that. And so I, uh, I definitely wouldn't, I don't treat them the same way I treat a rattlesnake. And at the same time I do, um, handle them more mindfully than, than something that is totally non-venomous and harmless. Yeah. They're, de they're definitely, they are a slightly advanced species in terms of just that being one thing, but they're, they're a large animal. They're, they, they require a lot of space. Like you said, they, they are very fast moving. They require places to climb and, and they yeah. are beautiful though. So it's a, it is interesting. Like it's totally. easy to see how you could be so captivated with them. Yeah. 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 And it's, you know, it's the, the other thing too, that I've really noticed about them is, um, I don't, you know, I don't tend to handle them too much. You know, I, 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 and if I do, I always give them the choice, you know, it's like, um, but what I've liked to do is, is I'll actually just kind of, like I said, open up the enclosure and let them kind of come out and explore. But a couple, sometimes they'll actually come out and actually climb on, me, you know, and just like explore and smell me and stuff like that. And that's such a different kind of experience than reaching in and like taking a snake out as it like rips out all the plants on the yeah, way out. <laughs> exactly. As it's like trying to like desperately hold on. Yeah. And, enclosure and staying at safe space it's it's really been interesting to like um just experiment with different ways of interacting with them and and um you know ways that don't elevate their stress levels and 
um, it's pretty amazing, you know, just like I'll kind of reach out and offer my hand and they'll sometimes come over and smell me. And, and, um, those, those times when they do come out, it's really, it's such a, such a different thing than, than yeah, having them rip out all the plants. On the yeah. Way yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, one thing that we, I really wanted to chat about with you was just sort of the ethics of keeping these animals. Cause I'm guessing, cause I, when I'm listening to you talk, like the way your mind works seemed very similar to the way my mind works. And yeah. I'm guess uh, maybe I'm putting words in your head, but I'm, I'm guessing you probably hit a point where you're like, why, like, what is the purpose of these animals in my care? Like, why should I do that? And I know that you have a, a blog post on your, is that on your puffing snake website? The, um, I forget what the title of it is. Uh, the just why, a, the, the why, why snakes, that the, one. There is it? that one, which I, I want to talk about as well, but yeah. also the, the one where you're sort of talking about blackfish is sort of comparing oh, it because you had yeah. seen blackfish. That's on com. yeah. Yeah. So can, yeah. can you tell me a little bit about that? Obviously, you watch the documentary Blackfish, and then all of a sudden that sort of puts you in the hot seat as, a, as an animal keeper, right? Totally. Absolutely. You know, and, and honestly, this was something that I was, that I was really mindful of but as I was reapproaching the hobby is um, really being with the, the ethical complexity of like, um, of captivity, <laughs> you know, that, that, that is a loaded word, totally. you know, and, and I think that, you know, it's, it's funny because that word gets used really, um, really flippantly within the hobby. And I, and I wonder how often people actually think about like the context of that word and the origins and the etymology of it, because it's not savory. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty difficult, um, it's a difficult thing ethically to approach. And, um, and I think that, you know, for me, it's like, I really advocate for the highest possible standard of care, you know, and I'm constantly seeking to elevate the standard that I have, you know, it's like, like this, this big and en bigger enclosure that I'm, that I'm saving up for right now is like, a, is, you know, a step towards that. It's just realizing like, I think I could do better and I'm going to do better. Um, and consistently just reevaluating how are, how is it going and, and how can I, um, how can I do better with that? But, um, I think that it's also really important to understand that, um, that a lot of these species, um, that we're benefiting from, you know, it's like, it's like being able to work with, with animals in close proximity is something that, that humans have done for millennia. Um, it's an ancient thing. And it's, and it's, um, it's a profound gift. You know, I think that, um, it's filled me with a lot of gratitude and meaning and purpose in my life. Um, and then the question then comes from me of like, okay, well, um, I'm someone who feels like pretty committed to like asking the question, how can I sustain the things that have sustained me in my life? Like, what can I do to sustain those things and give back to those things? And um, you know, with, with captive animals, I think it's really important to consider that like their origins are somewhere on this earth, you know, and often in these far flung regions and often these far flung regions are like really imperiled by, um, by the state of the world right now and this, in this, in the ways in which we particularly in the West live our lives. Um, and and so advocating for, you know, an awareness of that and ideally for um, efforts to like mitigate those, those, um, those impacts on those, especially on those native, native animals um, is something that I feel really excited about as like, um, as one thing to explore um, that I think all of us in the hobby can do at some level. And if everyone is doing that on some level, the potential impact that that could have um, on these um, wild animals. Um, it's huge. It's huge. Yeah. It's it's really it's immeasurable and and I, um, I do think that that's actually an easy step for most people to take because everyone's already obsessed with the animal, right? So it's totally. just like we think it's amazing and to just say okay, we can help out the wild version of these animals. It's not it's not a big leap to take. No, it's not. It's really not a big leap and there's plenty and you know it's like there's a lot of organizations, you know, for for example, like you know, in the Amazon there are dozens of organizations that are actively working to conserve and protect that land, many of which are um, prioritizing the um, sovereignty of indigenous peoples in those lands, which is like, I think it very much attached to like the long-term well-being of these animals is, is, is acknowledging that like, actually like these are animals that have, that have, um, 
grown in relationship with ecologies that have been heavily influenced and managed by indigenous people. Um, and, um, and so that's also really important as well. And um, so I think that there's, there's a lot there in, in terms of exploring, you know, the ethics of it. I think for myself also, you know, I, tr I really am trying to, um, yeah, create as much choice in the lives of the animals that I work with as possible, you know, and that's like, like that was, you know, alluded to in like the difference between reaching, you know, into their enclosures and pulling them out when they don't want to be held versus, you know, offering my hand and saying, Hey, you can come out if you want. And, um, but it's also like offering them different, different prey and, um, you know, adding in new plants. It's like, it's amazing when I add in a new plant to the enclosure, they're, they're investigating it immediately. Like, and, or if a new leaf is opening on a, on a plant, you know, or a flower blooms, like invariably I'll see them within a day intently tongue flicking and investigating that. And, um, and so I'm, I'm constantly seeking to, to improve their lives, you know, and, and the amazing thing about that too, is that it's kind of like self rewarding to do that because the more, um, <laughs> the more I see them well and like exercising natural behaviors, the better I feel. Yes. About... It's a feed, it's a feedback loop, positive feedback. <laughs> totally. Loop. It's a positive feedback loop. And it's, um, it's really amazing to, to, to be in that, you know, it's like, and I think that a lot of people, you know, that, um, that, it, that don't understand necessarily, um, the broader implications of, of keeping animals ca in captivity. Um, would would derive a lot of people a lot of a lot of benefit from from exploring those questions you know and um i think that the you know particularly in the western world you know, there's there's a lot of aversion to to the notion of responsibility and accountability you know there's a yes. lot of contraction around those words yeah um and the notion of privilege and all of that and um i think that there's actually like for a lot of us um we actually derive a lot of meaning and purpose from those things um, if, if we actually embrace them. We do. And I think that's actually something that the hobby does in an excellent way is it gives people that deep purpose. And, and I think people may not realize that they're using the hobby or their care for animals to help them, to, to give them the responsibility that actually totally. helps them have a deeper meaning in their life. Like they, they're just, they think they love the hobby, which they do, but it's also fulfilling this much more, grand piece of their life than they think absolutely i agree and i also think a lot of that has to do with relationship too you know just like um you know our in our in our deep human ancestry you know it's like you know all of us come from people that were living really closely to animals at some stage and actually that had a that had an influence and in development in their identities and and in their worldviews and um you know, we can actually have like a tangible relationship with a snake and actually learn from the snake about how to be better, better humans, you know, and totally and that sounds kind of maybe a bit weird for some people to hear, hear me say that. And yet that is like, has been deeply true in my life that, um, the kind of awareness and attunement that is required to like really be in, in, um, in relationship with these animals has like had profound impacts on like every aspect of my life. In in terms, of, like I think you're probably meaning in terms of the way you approach them and and the 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 presence that you feel when you're working mm -hmm. with them. Is that what you mean? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a, it's it's um and it goes both ways. You know, I think a lot about like there's this one story that I have that I'll just briefly tell about um about the puffing snakes in particular. Where um so the first week after the snakes had arrived, they'd been here, they'd been with me for a week, and um every time I would, I would approach their enclosures, I would approach like very gently and like very mindfully um, with as much present as I, presence as I could, knowing that they were adjusting and acclimating. And after a week, um, I actually had a, a plan to go on a, a camping trip with my sweetheart for a couple days. And so I left, I left the house and um, my housemate, I asked her to just kind of keep an eye on the snakes, let me know if, if she saw anything out of the usual, out of unusual while I was gone. And um, while I was gone, she said, she, she texted me at one point. She said, um, one of the lights isn't, 
isn't turning on like the other ones with the and um with the timer and everything and i was like oh that's I was like, okay, well, which one is it? And it was like the LED, you know, kind of accent light. And I was like, okay, it's not a big deal. Um, for, for, you know, I don't have to like rush home, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, 500 miles to go, to go um, attend to this. I can do it in a couple of days when I get back. And, um, but still, you know, the, the, the moment that I got back, I immediately just went, took a beeline for the enclosures, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> rushed over to go check on the snakes. And I, I, show up at the front of the enclosure and um and one of the snakes just reared up immediately and just goes and just strikes and hits the glass trying to strike and bite bite my face and and it was like a strong reflection a strong mirror to me of like you better come correct like you know like you're gonna come over here you gotta like do it a little bit more mindfully than that you know and i was i kind of was like oh god i'm sorry you know and yeah and um fixed the light they had just like somehow they had touched the switch and just like switched off but um but that was like a, a significant moment where i was just thinking of like wow there's such a different there's such a different thing in um in receiving that reflection of like um, you have an impact. The way that you approach situations has an impact. Um, and it's important to be mindful of that. It's not a chore to be mind <laughs> to be mindful of that. It's actually enriching to do that. Um, but the other thing is like, yeah, that set me on kind of a deeper inquiry into just realizing that through the period of my kind of like adolescence and approaching adulthood, um, I was like, in some ways, pretty isolated. You know, I didn't have, I had, I had, I had a lot of friends and all that stuff like that. But in terms of like my home life, I would most of the time come home to an empty house. Um, and, um, and yet like I would spend hours every night tending to the animals and, um, and just like, um, I realized like, wow, like, not only am I, um, is that requiring me to be really present with them if I'm to interact with them in a way that doesn't create more stress for them, but they're also like, they're present with me too. You know, it's like oh, yeah. you're, you're working with the animals, like they know where you are in the room, you know? And when I come into the room, like I know that, that the snakes know I'm there and, and, I, and I know that they recognize me um, versus like my housemates um, as the one who interacts with them. And, um, and that is like, that's, that's, that's powerful. That's like, that actually has, um, that's a relationship that goes both ways. And, and, um, that definitely, I think had a, had an impact on me as a particular in that really formative time in my life. It's one of those things that I, I noticed in the hobby is that I see a lot of people like this could be a generalization, but I see people who are seemingly struggling with mental health that gravitate towards reptiles. And it's one of the, it, you, you just, it's noticeable when you go to an expo too, you see a lot of people that, that are, it's, I don't know if it's, they're using the hobby to help them with it, but I, I suspect it is. I suspect it's sort of a similar situation. Like you're saying, where you have a, a tough life situation and those animals are just helping you get through it. I, I, I deeply agree with that, you know, and, and I've noticed that as well. And, um, and, you know, and I, and I want to be careful, you know, in terms of what I say too, I don't want to create, you know, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I, but just speaking for myself, if I may, like, um, I, I definitely think that it has a lot to do with isolation, you know, and, and it's, it's unusual because we're living in these times when we're, um, constantly inundated with, with um communications and stimulation um and um it's like there there are these, there's all these statements made about how we're more connected than ever due to things like social media and being able to text message and and all of these things and yet they're all like one step removed from face to face like co-regulation with another human being which is actually something that's like really vital to like our our development um and totally. our wellness right and it's not the same thing and also like you know social networks don't serve the same function as communities no. and um and i think that that's really important to make that distinction um and and so i think that there's a lot of though there's in some ways we are more connected than ever in these like superficial ways i think that there's also 
um, pretty alarming statistics in terms of like how isolated people feel in this day and age. Um, and I definitely was with that, you know, in those times. Um, and I think that that's just like, that has a lot to do with, you know, just the Western worldview and, um, you know, there's a lot of the, the one of the, the primary differences, you know, that, that gets outlined, you know, kind of like anthrop anthropology, you know, between like the Western worldview and an indigenous worldview is that, um, in the Western worldview, we're, you know, very focused on individualism and, and, and all that. And in, in an indigenous worldview, your interrelationship is the foundation of, of understanding, you know, and, um, that has profound implications, you know, and, and I think that, um, working with animals, um, is definitely one way of being in contact with, with, um, intimacy, you know, and, and, um, and connection and, and, and co-regulation and all of these things that, um, are deeply important to our, our, the human animal, <laughs> you know, in ways that I don't understand, totally. but I, but I experience it, you know, yeah. it's like I experience how different I feel when I've been working with my animals for an hour versus when like, I just got home from work and I'm stressed out, you know, and I need to decompress. It's like, if I just go sit with the snakes for a little bit. I'm like, I'm in a different place. You know, that, yes. has, that has, there, there's a lot true. going on behind the scenes in our own, uh, brains and minds that we are totally unaware of because we aren't just another animal right and it's just like we have this like slightly elevated level of consciousness but we also do a lot of stuff that you just don't even know why you do it or why you think yeah it. totally and and totally. connecting with nature does sort of reignite or sort of it it, 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 it feels refreshing. Like you said, it, it gives you that sort of laid back feel and, and it, it can definitely help you in this Western world that's very fast paced and, and it's about, you know, technology and all these things. It feels so much better to just go into the woods and yeah. experience nature and then, and then, then, you know, scroll through Instagram and look at pictures of trees. <laughs> Absolutely. It's pretty amazing how different those things are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, like for that. it's almost like so so to, to, to kind of put this into a, a nutshell, the, the hobby does have those two sides. Where one, it is profoundly important to people that it, it keeps them healthy and gives them a purpose, which it is very important because people without purpose can come very depressed and anxious, and and, and that radiates uh, inside the community in, in negative ways. And so, giving somebody something to do, but also making sure that they're aware that they have to do that in a way that's beneficial to the animal and you can Absolutely. do that by increasing your the level of your care or and, and directing some of your uh, energy towards conservation those are two great ways that you can ethically keep these animals yeah exactly you know and like i think that really what you're speaking to there is like orienting to working with animals as something that we're privileged to rather than entitled to yes. you know and really understanding that like it is a, it's a profound privilege to get to work with animals you know, completely. That's something that we actually have to, um, yeah, we should, we should, we should be striving to, um, to rise to that occasion and rise to that privilege. And, um, and, and the, unfortunately, you know, that's, that's a larger thing too, you know, of just like entitlement and, and, um, and I think that there's a, there's a lot to be said there. And, um, and I, I see it and I'm that said, I'm really grateful to say that like I see more and more of that showing up in the hobby. Um and more and more care and um concern being expressed for like ethical welfare, animal welfare, and um and also like, you know, companies too, also that are like really rallying around that as like their um their emphasis. You know, I was I was really excited to see um um, hear the announcement about the sponsorship with custom reptile habitats and just like um, seeing what they're doing to advocate for like, let's like, let's like really like give these, these animals the best thing we can, you know? Yes. And, um, and uh, you know, there was a time in the hobby where that would have been really edgy to say that. And I'm yeah. grateful to see that it's becoming more normalized. Totally. Yeah. I think the hobby is definitely moving to a, a, a direction and it's awesome talking to someone like yourself who you're just a, you're, you're a hobbyist that's really on the cutting edge of the species wise anyway, but you're also up to some awesome things and it's great to highlight that for people who are listening and, and 
I would almost put you up with a, a gold standard uh, level of care and and just your in, the, the, your curiosity is is what's driving your success there and it's really cool and and being able to to start from scratch with a higher knowledge base is a really cool thing so I'm glad that you're <laughs> you took that opportunity to do it right so that's uh, that's awesome so thank you very much um, for for coming on the show is there anything that you you want to add as a last little minute that I want to make sure that you've You've said everything that you'd like to say. Um, well, first, I would just say thank you for that. Like, I really, um, I really appreciate that reflection, and and um, I feel really honored to have been invited to be on the podcast. You know, I was kind of like when when you sent me that email, I was like, oh gosh, like there's there's been a lot of really amazing heavy hitters on this podcast. I'm like, what am I doing with these folks? And um, and so I feel honored that um, you created some space for me to share a bit about my story and. Um, I guess if there's one other thing I would just kind of advocate for in, in the hobby is, is also like you spoke to like starting from being able to start from scratch with a higher level of knowledge. And that's just um, one thing that I see is really important in the hobby as well is, is um, cultivating a culture of like mentorship and inheritance so that we're actually like, so people don't have to start from scratch. Yes. Great point. <laughs> and make all the same mistakes. Yeah. You know, because because that's definitely like, the, I was really fortunate, you know, to, um, to be able to like communicate with some folks online through the forums and stuff like that back then about like, well, this is how you got to incubate these eggs. And like, you got to make sure that like the incubation medium has this much water. Like when you squeeze it, you know, it's got that much water dripping out of it and all, all these like little tips and stuff like that, that, um, thankfully, um, um, are accessible. And, and that is, that is the, great way to utilize these social networks that we have totally um and the communication capacities that we have now is to um is to really uplift um, new hobbyists and and so i also see this this podcast as something that's really um rallied around that and doing that and so um we we'll just thank you for for creating this platform it's been great yeah no it's been a, it's been awesome i've really enjoyed it and uh, yeah that's a great point in terms of talking about you know we don't have to start from scratch every time this as a look really sort of funny story that i had this weekend i went to the local reptile expo here with one of my really good friends and his brother and and they don't really know a ton about reptiles but they wanted to to see it and and my friend does listen to my podcast and so his brother was going to want to like impulsively buy a crested gecko and he's like just <laughs> just go listen to dylan's podcast and it will make you not want to buy a reptile <laughs> and it was like it is essentially what he meant was you realize how much work it is and and you really want to make sure you want to do the work it's not the same as totally. like you want to be able to set up the substrates and and, and do all the balancing for the climate and everything that's got to be your interest it can't be the cre little cute crested gecko in the deli cup that's just like yeah. The cherry on top in a way totally it's got to be a labor of love totally Otherwise, yeah just don't do it <laughs> yeah exactly you can come look at them and that's it so can you let everybody know where they can find you online yeah yeah absolutely so i um i have a few different websites um the primary one that's relevant to this conversation is um puffingsnakes.com which is um kind of a resource hub that i've brought together trying to kind of elucidate this mysterious snake of the Amazon puffing snake that I'm so passionate about. Um, and I've got a lot of blog posts there and some natural history resources and um, husbandry resources, including like quarantine and acclimation um, tips and all of that. Um, and then in addition to that, kind of I have my own kind of personal website, which is more kind of my writing. I do a lot of poetry and, um, and some writing and I work as a naturalist here in um, the North Bay area in California. And that's um, RoyArthurBlodgett.com. And uh, my Instagram handle is Roy underscore Arthur. I'm on Facebook at Roy Arthur Blodgett. So that's where you can find me. I'd love to hear from anybody. Awesome. I will make sure everything's in the show notes. So thank you very much for, for joining me today. It was a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much. And with that, we find ourselves at the end of another episode. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. It is so interesting listening to Roy talk about that the Amazon puffing snake. You have to go Google some pictures. I'll make sure there's everything in the show notes. They're a really, really beautiful species. And Roy, if you're listening, thank you very much for graciously joining me on the episode of the podcast, as well as going over the hour that we had planned. That was fascinating. If you guys are interested, make sure you go check out puffingsnake.com. 
Roy has some really, really awesome, I mean, he's an incredible writer, so you'll notice that right away, but he has some really awesome articles as well, some great pictures, and if you are interested in writing outside of the reptile world, definitely go check out his personal site, RoyArthurBlodgett.com, for his poetry as well as some other writing. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, CustomReptileHabitats.com. Go check out the website, link is in the description on YouTube as well as the show notes. You can find a multitude of different items and high class quality equipment for your reptile. I will talk to you guys in two weeks.